Are we on the we're on the thirteenth letter? Is that right? I believe in this book anyway. I found another book the other day that doesn't even have the letters numbered the same. Mine is different too, Maharaj. Is it? Well, yeah. this one is. I am in pain to see you suffer so long. That's how it starts. Oh, that is fourteen in my book. Oh, fourteen. Okay, interesting. <laughs> I should. I should pull up a few of these versions and see if I'm missing a letter. All right, the 13th letter from our beloved brother Lawrence. I don't know, I think it was his monastery. I'm not sure, I think it was his monastery. I think I read about where they made the door to the monastery very, very, a very, very narrow hallway. So that if you were too heavy, <laughs> if you were carrying a bit too much weight, you couldn't fit through the hallway to get to the dining room. <laughs> <laughs> These Christians, I tell you, they have some clever ways of doing things. So anyway, the 13th letter to the same. I am in pain to see you suffer so long. Ah, yeah. Wow, already. There you see that exactly what Swami uh, or what uh, uh, Sri Nishagadatta says. When I see someone suffering, I don't see someone suffering. I suffer. And so you, here you see another saint with the same experience that he's in pain to see you suffer so long. What gives me some ease and sweetens the feelings I have for your grief is that they are proof of God's love toward you. <laughs> that's a wonderful way of seeing suffering to know because we, we talked about that a little bit i guess last week maybe in the sense that that during good times during comfort we don't tend to think of god of course later on we do we learn our lesson after some time but uh in the beginning we often don't think of mother as much when we're having fun or when we're out enjoying ourselves but when we suffer oh then we're thinking of mother all the time demanding an explanation. Why me? <laughs> Why do I have to suffer? We never question our joy. <laughs> we deserve our joy after all, right? So here it is. I have for your grief, the, the, the thing that sweetens the feelings I have for your grief is that they are proof of God's love toward you. See them in that view and you will bear them more easily. Yeah, to see your suffering as a love letter is quite, well, it's a tall order for one, but it, it, it does add a, a beautiful sense of intimacy and purpose to what you're going through. And it does allow you to have the space to kind of do the inquiry that Nishagadatta Maharaj talks about, to go in and see why, what, it, what is the source of pain? What is the source of suffering? And... Um, there's a lot can be learned from it. I remember when I broke my leg, here we go, telling that story again. I remember breaking my leg in 2008. Oh my God, I, there's nothing that hurts like that. Oof. And I laid in that bed, you know, I had the, <laughs> in one sense, a great misfortune to break my leg in a monastery because I was then having to uh, lay in bed i couldn't move I, my leg was raised and if i ever got anywhere near the level of my heart the pain uh, would be oh my god i would almost pass out from that shock of pain that would come over me and i had to lay there for for i i was there for several weeks uh, uh not able to get out of that bed and it wasn't even in my room it was down in the living room and there was only me and swami in the monastery and he would be over in his office all day and there was no television, there was no radio, <laughs> there, was, there was nothing but books, which you don't feel like reading when you're on painkillers, you know. So I had a lot of time to experiment with pain and experiment with the feelings. And some of the great ideas that came out of that suffering was this notion of being able to see, to have your body break. What a strange thing that was to think about, that my body's broken. And I had no sense of me being broken at all. So I could really see the difference. I could really feel the difference. Well, look, the body is a material thing that can break. You know, 
that had never really occurred to me before in that sense, like a broken cup, that the body is just that. It's just a material thing that can break. And so it helped me to see that separateness and seeing that separateness, knowing that the body was other, that I was not broken, helped me to relegate that pain to something other than me. It put some space in there so that I realized that just like I, I could watch Scooby-Doo and not hear my mother yelling at me to mow the lawn, that in that same trained ability to not pay attention to something, that you can also lay in bed with a broken leg and not hear it, that you can put it away, that because it's not you, you have a choice. Mm -hmm. You know, the pain was there, no doubt, but the suffering is optional. If you place the mind at the feet of the mother, there's no suffering for you. If you keep your mind on the body and you keep your mind on the mind, <laughs> some of us have the misfortune of being in constant suffering <laughs> from those ideas. So see them in that view and you will bear them more easily. As your case is, it is my opinion that you should leave off human remedies and resign yourself entirely to the providence of God. Wait, did we do this one? No. Hmm. No. So he says, uh, and this one, um, you know, Ramakrishna has a little bit of a different approach. And so I would probably take Ramakrishna's advice in this circumstance. Because uh, Ramakrishna didn't see a difference between a physician and God. So he wouldn't say, don't go to a doctor, let God heal you. Mm -hmm. He'd say, go to the doctor and let God heal you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, and also that story of the, the Mahut on the crazy elephant, you know, where where he, he, the Mahut also is God. So the, the story is, just in case you don't remember, is that that young monk who, whose teacher told all of the Sangha that morning that God, uh, God is in everything. And so he's out walking and there's this mad elephant running and the Mahut on the elephant is screaming for everybody to get out of the way. But the young monk reasons, oh, but the, the elephant is God. Why should I be afraid? Why should I run away? And so he ignores it. And of course, the elephant comes and it says that he picks the monk up and throws him into a tree against a tree and knocks him out and he falls down wounded. And the disciples carry his body to the teacher and he comes to and uh, the teacher is saying, why? <laughs> why didn't you run away and save yourself? And he says, well, you told us that everything was God and I thought the elephant was God. Why should I be afraid? And he says, you fool. If everything is God, then the Mahut is also God, and he's yelling at you to get out of the way. Why did you not get out of the way? And so this, this notion, I think, comes to the forefront here. So he's saying that, he's saying that, as your case is, it is my opinion, so it's not his teaching, just his opinion, that you should leave off human remedies and resign yourself entirely to the providence of God. Perhaps he stays only for that resignation, and a perfect trust in him to cure you. Mm. Now, I think both of those can be true. <laughs> but I don't uh, think... Yes, uh, what's that? Uh, no, uh, th that is where there is a difference between Holy Mother and uh, Thakur, I think. Because Holy oh. Mother used to go to the temple and just lie down there. There is a problem. Leaving everything to God, I do not know. She might have taken some remedies from the doctors, but in certain cases, she just went to the temple and just put herself there to be cured. Yeah, yeah you're right. Uh, that's why I say both can be true. You know, uh, they're not exclusive. Um, it, it's really, I, I don't know, it, it could be a matter of your faith. You know, yeah. there's certainly, certainly to, be, to have dispassion you know, and to have faith and to say there is no medicine but but God and Gunga water, you know, for me, which is what some of the sadhus say, perfect. That is beautiful. No reason not to think that way and be that way if that is your faith and that's your conviction. You know, uh, otherwise, if you want to see God in the doctor and go to the doctor to have God heal you, perfect. Do that. If that is your faith and that is that is the way it is for you, absolutely right, you know. Uh, but all the, the the substrate of both of them 
is know that it is the divine that heals you or sickens you either way that you are always in the hands of the beloved he may send many different people to you to help you you know to to heal you or whatnot but to know always underneath all of them it is by the will of god that you are healed it is by the hand of the divine that you either live or die and to hold that as your comfort either way you know the, the the important thing i think is to have that resignation to accept the hand of love and to believe in the hand of love that even in your suffering it is for love and that's why uh he he says that at the beginning of the letter you know that is that is all of our ailments as law as well as all of our enjoyments are sourced in a, an unconditioned love of the universe for us of the divine mother for us so he says since notwithstanding all your cares physic has hitherto proved unsuccessful and your malady still increases it will not be tempting god to abandon yourself in his hands and expect all from him so there's a little bit more context she has been going to doctors and it's getting worse there's not any help there and so there you know in this context maybe that is a good time to resign it's a good time to look past the healing or the sickness i also have to wonder in that era what the doctors were like <laughs> i mean it might be that ramakrishna's approach was you know was fitting of the times <laughs> right oh yes absolutely all of that comes into play you know if they were if they were letting blood and you know bandaging you in leeches <laughs> it might be a good time to depend on god it's true of course if they're prescri prescribing you 49 medicines that are doing all kinds of weird things to you that also might be a good time to abandon and go to god but either way, I think, you know, the, the message is clear that it is that it is you are sick because of God and you are healed because of the divine, that that it is not indicative of, of anything else. And that if the divine heals you, it will be with or without a physician. That's up to you. And that's up to his dance with you as it is. But uh, I wouldn't take I, I don't want it to become a belief that we should not go to doctors. Right. <laughs> You know, because I don't think that's that's compatible with what Takur said. He took everything that came his way as being from the Lord. And so, uh, and we see that it was. And in his case, he went and, uh, you know, it also didn't heal him. He died of throat cancer. And uh, that was perfectly acceptable to him as well. And we see even more oddly that, that he really wasn't subject to that illness, that it was part of the divine play. That he was able to put it aside at will and then pick it up again when it was when it was time so it's all a great mystery in that sense great fun actually <laughs> in a way when you kind of realize that all of this is sort of a dreamy play by someone who loves you very deeply and to to be able to find that faith inside to interpret it and understand it as such to see that love and to try to do nothing but manifest that love in the midst of it. Yeah. I told you in my last that he sometimes permits bodily diseases to cure the distempers of the soul. Have courage then, make a virtue of necessity. Ask of God, not deliverance from your pain, but strength to bear resolutely for the love of him all that he should please and as long as he shall please so there it is that's the sum of it you know that that the lord is trying to accomplish something in you positive always that everything in your life no matter how how much of a struggle it is no matter how much pain there is in it everything is there to bring you to your realization and the more faith that you have, I think that sometimes the more suffering you endure because you're able to. And mother wants to quicken the path. And so she puts on some intensity for you, you know, to bring you there. You look at what Vivekananda had to go through. 
You know, it's stunning. When he chose to become a monk, he actually believed that he was choosing to let his family die of starvation. I cannot even oh. comprehend that. No. I can't even comprehend that. And yet he took that decision and he made that decision with such a firmness and such a resolute faith that this had to be done for the sake of, of getting the word of his teacher in out to you and me. And then, of course, mother proved him wrong anyway. She didn't starve his family to death. She promised him they'll always have at least enough to be alive, you know, and that was good enough. But he didn't get that assurance till later. So that's it's quite an amazing thing. But to know that in this life, to have that level of faith, that level of conviction, to know this to be true. And the interesting thing is, you know, I think where a lot of us fall short or, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I went through a period when I first got here, really contemplating whether I was willing to live under a bridge for the sake of God or not. And, <laughs> you know, I think the, the, the problem is when we, when we want to test God in that way, if she did leave us under the bridge, we would see that as a failure. Oh, mother's not taking care of me. Look at me. I'm having to live under a bridge, you know, and I think it's because of that, uh, that, that we don't understand what we're testing of God because to God, it doesn't matter whether this body falls or not. It doesn't matter whether this mind falls or not. You know, God, God knows that this body is no consequence to us. And so he's not going to serve the body just because we want him to, you know, and it may be that he'll let you starve to death when you test him. You know, we have stories, of course, of Vivekananda and the other disciples testing mother. And uh, she brings food to them and, you know, from by showing up to people in dreams, telling them to go and bring food to my, my, my son down at the gas station or at the train station. So we know there is that. And we think, oh, if it turns out that way, then God is with me. Ah, oh, but if I actually starve to death, oh, God's not with me. Well, that's the fallacy. You see, when, when, when they tested God, they were perfectly willing to go to the end. They weren't going to see if God behaved properly or in their favor. They just said, let's see what mother brings. She may bring death. She may bring lunch. <laughs> we'll see. So that's our resolution. That's our surrender in life. You know, we lay there in bed, deathly ill. We don't pray for our healing. That's what he says here. He says, don't ask of God, not deliverance from your pain, but strength to bear it resolutely. To, to the, the faith, to know that you're surrounded by love, regardless of the condition. Conditions are only thoughts. They're just thoughts in your head. Pain is just a thought in your head. Sickness is just a thought in your head. All suffering, all, all pleasure, everything is just a thought in your head. It is nothing more than that. All of this, everything you imagine the universe to be is just a thought because that is all you have ever seen. That's all you've ever seen is the thinking of your mind. You've never actually seen what your eyes see. You've never actually heard what your ears hear. They hand it off to the nerves and the nerves bring you the information. And the information is interpreted by the mind and the picture is painted on your mind. And you, the witness, see the mind. You never see a world. You never see a person. You never see a tree. You never see the sun. You see the symbols of those things that your mind is presenting to you from the data it's getting from who knows where, <laughs> who knows where. You know, it's very comfortable to say from the outside, but the sages say there is no outside. So it's a fallacy to think that this data that we're observing on the mind, that this consciousness we're seeing reflected in mind has any real indication of a world at all. It doesn't. And so through all of this, mother teaches us that and by knowing that, we become a little less attached to it. We begin to understand that we can't be touched. It's like going to a movie to make friends. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. 
the movie's going to play and the people are going to be there and you're going to enjoy their company, but by no means are you friends. They come and they go with the movie, right? And so that's the nature of this world. Don't make your home here. You're at the movies. <laughs> Everything around you is going to come and it's going to go and you're going to leave the theater at some point. Let it go. Worry not. Cry hard in the movie. Laugh hard in the movie. But never forget, it's for the fun of the movie that you're enjoying it. You know? So see it that way. Understand. Such prayers indeed are a little hard to nature, but most acceptable to God and sweet to those that love him. <laughs> beautiful so there he lays it out it's hard because of nature because of body because of mind it's hard to have this resolution because we identify with these things you know just like we identified last night in our dream with whatever body we were toting around back then that's why uh, these these wrestlings with gender and whatnot that are going on in the mainstream eye today entertaining at some level not entertaining in the sense that laugh at them not at all but just understanding that the real truth of the matter is none of us have a gender at all, or each one of us has every gender. And so if we go, the, if we go this route of coming up with a new pronoun for every gender that we can, can, can decide to be within our mind, we might as well just pick up names. You know, I might as well just, just get rid of pronouns altogether and call you by your name because you are that unique and you will always be that unique. But pronouns were never about uniqueness. Pronouns were a generalization so that we could talk about people that we didn't know at all. Oh, look at him over there. Oh, look at her over there. Or look at they over there. Whatever it is, the pronoun is not about the subject. The pronoun is a nondescript reference. So if we're gonna go the pronoun route, we should come up with a pronoun that backs off even farther and doesn't say he, she, or they, just says human, right? There's a human. Let their gender be whatever they want their gender to be, just like their name is whatever their name is. You know, we can't possibly have to go around telling everybody the different gradations of gender according to whatever the style of the day is and come up with a, yet another pronoun to describe it, right? Why am I talking about this? I don't know. It's in my mind. Mm -hmm. So this is the thing. You know, there's no right or wrong in it. We need to respect each other. But let's not respect each other by, by holding gender as the one prime thing that we choose a pronoun for with each other. Let's respect each other because we're human beings. We're vehicles of the beloved. And, you know, if he and she is bothersome, then let's come up with a new pronoun that doesn't divide even that. That just says human. Know. So Hume, maybe I'm, maybe I'm a Hume. I'm not a him or a her, a they or a them. I'm a Hume. I'm a human. I think some people use Z. Z. Mm. That's a good one. Cool. And of, yeah. course, of course, cool. if you're Latin now, that's Latinx, which I've heard that's that's reviled deeply by the Latin community. <laughs> you know, because we don't have gender descriptions in for. Latinos or Latinas in English. But anyway, all of that is there. The bottom line is the problem isn't with gender. You know, the, 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 be what you are and be happy that you're that way and be that way delightfully with the mother. You know, but let's, let's not get caught up in these things as being that, that all important. We're much more than gender. We're far beyond a gender. This gender is a very temporary thing. A very small thing. Such prayers indeed are a little hard to nature, but most acceptable to God and sweet to those that love him. You know, so this notion that accepting things as they are is the highest ideal because it's born of love. That's the only way you can accept life as it is, is to accept the love that you believe or that you intuit to be behind it. To believe that all things work together for good is the highest worship to the divine. You know, it's 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 the beginning. Of, Eckhart Tolle says, "Don't just accept what happens; love it." 
lean into it, he says. If things are bad, just lean into it. Don't just accept them. Love it. Throw your whole self at it. You know, this, know that all things are God. God is everywhere present and always beautiful. Everywhere present and always perfect. Well, probably the same thing. But anyway, God is everywhere present and always perfect. So throw yourself into life. Take what comes. You know, don't shrink back for a second. Run with a with a might and, and a, a singularity of mind and a, a you know, a, a zeal for, for love. And just throw your life into being a lover. A lover of everything you see, taste, touch, hear, or smell. You know, and those things that you, that don't sit favorable with you, <laughs> love them even more. Have a second helping of broccoli, you know, <laughs> which is actually insincere because I love broccoli. But anyway, such, such indeed are a little hard to nature, but most acceptable to God and sweet to those that love him. Love sweetens pains. And when one loves God, one suffers for his sake with joy and with courage. Uh, so that's throwing that self into love. Love sweetens pains. It's a marvelous thing when you are suffering to, to do something for someone else anyway. That's an amazing gift. <laughs> you know, that's the gift of a mother. You know, one thing mothers can teach the world, you know, is that selflessness. Uh, you know, I can remember my mother being sick and still taking care of my father, you know, still getting up and going and making dinner for the kids, even though she wasn't feeling well. And, uh, you know, of course, we could talk about what bad children we were for not taking care of our sick mother, and that would be true. But the lesson we could also learn is, is that even in sickness, we can serve and love. And quite often, that in itself takes our mind off of our own suffering, you know, to, to, to be that way. Love sweetens pains, and when one loves God, one suffers for his sake with joy and with courage. Do you so, I beseech you, comfort yourself with him who is the only physician of all of our maladies. He is the father of the afflicted, always ready to help us. He loves us infinitely more than we imagine. That's something that I would sit with. If I read that on my own <laughs> at this point, I would just close the book and I would just keep repeating that little thought in my head as I sat there in the in front of the shrine. He loves me infinitely more than I imagine. So I would infinitely, I would sit there just trying to imagine how much I think God, God's love is, how much I think that love itself could love. Sit there and think about that and then try and imagine infinitely more. <laughs> you know, what a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful statement. The father of the afflicted, always ready to help us. All right, there's another little phrase. That the divine is always ready to help. That God is always a positive influence in your life. Always. The thought of God is always positive. That's a good thing to test yourself with. Because I think a lot of us have a lot of fear or a lot of distrust or a lot of doubt around that, these ideas of the divine. But what a beautiful promise that the Lord, the beloved, is always ready to help us and loves us infinitely more than we can imagine. Love him then. See? So his love is the condition that inspires our love. You know, that, that, yeah, that God loves first. That's a great lesson too. You know, a few weeks ago, I think I talked about it in one of the blogs. One of the in one of the blog in one of the classes, this class actually, the Vedic Christianity class, it gets a lot of pushback in the comments sometimes. Mm. And somebody in the comments wrote, "Why would you ever mix Christianity with the Vedas? Christianity is a cancer on the planet." Yeah, you know. <laughs> I was like, okay, well, <laughs> that's an idea. But the thing is, the, my, my feeling toward that is that, well, there's plenty of Christians that feel the same way about Hinduism. 
So we've got both people siding up on both sides, thinking the other is a cancer to humanity. My question in that arrangement is, who's going to be the first one to love? You know, who's going to be the first one to love? We can square off with each other if we want to. We can blame each other for the troubles of the world if we want to. But in that standoff, who's going to be the first one to love? Let it be me. Let it be you. Let us break that boundary. Let us be the first one to respect our enemy. Let us be the first one to, to hug the hater. Oof, mother just gave me a punch in the side. <laughs> it's just like, oof. Because boy, I tell you in this modern world, hate is popular. You know? yes, absolutely. Hate is popular. So when you see it, when you see that person who's the opposite political stance of you, who's the opposite orientation from you, who's the opposite anything of you. Ask yourself, can I be the first one to love? Can I look past this thing and see the human behind it? You know, can I look past the human and see God behind it? Am I, do, will I dare <laughs> to see God in something so utterly different from myself? You know? So this is the thing, the father of the afflicted, always ready to help. He loves us infinitely more than we imagine. So love him. Seek no consolation elsewhere. That's, that's a big statement right there because that covers everything else in your life. Don't look for consolation. Don't look for joy. Don't look for fulfillment. Don't look for happiness. Don't look for entertainment beyond this magnificent love of the divine in the divine you know this also grows in conviction with time because we start to realize at some point that everything is a thought everything is passing that somehow we're just watching it all happen you know uh that's one of my favorite things these days because i'm on the doorstep of old age and I love, I love to, to watch it happen. You know, Greg and I were comparing age spots on our hands today. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh my God, look, it's happened. I have age spots on my hand. Only my grandmother's had age spots. I never imagined my own hand would have age spots on it. So we watch it happen. We watch our body grow old. But we, we, the, that, that wonderful, marvelous <laughs> observer inside, ever free, ever pure, no aging, no death, no pain, no suffering, just this emanation of pure love, always inside, always available, if we can but take our eyes off of any other thing for consolation than the divine presence within always if you hurt in any way sit and be quiet absolutely quiet meaning absent yourself from the thought of your suffering absent yourself from the thought of pain and be only with the beloved with the beloved that 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 divine sense of love that is your consolation that is enough that will bring you through this life <laughs> he's agreeing or he's protecting you from something <laughs> pure the dogs dogs by the way pets by the way what a great manifestation of that love oh My unbelievable God. yeah 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 that loyalty that sweetness you can leave them pent up in a house all day long come home from work and they're just happy as punch to see you any other human being would be like, how dare you lock me up in this little place with no one here all day? Where have you been? Why are you out there enjoying yourself? The dogs, no. Always happy to see you. This, is, <laughs> I hate to put God in the picture of a dog, but I imagine, I think we see love in dogs a lot easier than we see love in each other. So in, sense, in a sense, God, God is a dog to us in this modern world. The only one who's always happy to see us always glad for our company people used to be um in shock because swami ashashananda used to give uh, prasad to the devotees dogs 
Mm. <laughs> yeah. I mean, no, it was great. unbelievable. And he had this orange cat, Holy Mother's cat, who, you know, was this frail old thing. And he'd be lecturing to a packed house. And then she would just come walking in and go up and sit right next to him. He, he loved the animals. It was really beautiful to see. Yeah. And then no, people that's... would bring their animal when they had died. And he would take it in the shrine. I mean, it, it's in that phenomenal. It, it's a, it, it, yes. Yes, it is. <laughs> because especially, I mean, if it was, if it was a Western monk, it wouldn't be so phenomenal because we're kind of, we kind of think of animals that way. Yeah, but yeah. India animals are not thought of that way, especially right. by Brahmins and folk, you know, they're, they're right. impure, they're dirty. And so it, that's marvelous. That's a yeah. marvelous. And, and somebody like him, you know, always come out as no fooling around with anything and right. <laughs> always. Yeah. Right. It was really wow. remarkable. It is. It really is. Phenomenal. Yeah. Phenomenal, wow. phenomenal person. Yeah. He was, he was God. Yeah. And True. he sought within all of us. Yes. That's when we right. didn't even realize. <laughs> anyway, yeah. thank you. <laughs> no, that's wonderful. Are, you. are you a student of his? Yeah, I'm a disciple of his. When I was 17, I was initiated with him. Oh, how wonderful. I am too, but yeah. not at that young age. But Yeah, he was extraordinary. Yes. Really, really, really incredible. So, yes. <laughs> <laughs> amazing uh, just an incredible person absolutely I never, I never got to meet him but i've heard so many stories about him and there i saw some video of him <laughs> it was something that really endeared me to him he was giving a lecture and he was trying to to get his chutter off or something like that yeah yeah and he, and he got tangled in it and he was <laughs> and he was lecturing with this chutter over the top of him and he literally oh, yeah. was trying to yeah. fight his way out of that chutter and still lecturing at the same time. And I just thought, I love, I love this. I yeah. love this, you know. And uh, it, it is a sight to see him do worship. Oh, it, unbelievable. It is un unbelievable. Un it, unbelievable. He just stands on one knee and throws things. But there is something magical about that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Unbelievable. And towards the end of his life, you know, he... He had this. He had the suit that Swami Nikilananda had given him 50 years earlier or 40 wow. years earlier, and it was just sort of in rags. But you know, he wore that suit and he wore the sweater, and and he was just like a radiant king. But it was it was really extraordinary to be in his presence. So, anyway, wow. you yeah, you would have been. You would have just been blown away by him, Swami. Yeah, I imagine yes. what, what a what a privilege. And he would have blessed you for doing what you're doing now. He would be right there. He really would. Be. He really would be. Yep. Don't you agree, Kamala? I do. I do. I do. Absolutely. Absolutely, he would. Well, that's that's sorry. Beautiful. As traditional as he is. It is very nice to watch one of his videos where he has gone to the retreat and doing the worship there. Mm. He did not change anything with full shoes, with the shoes and everything he's doing, Aarti. It is, <laughs> and he is a very traditional person too, in one yeah. way. Yeah. Yeah, well, that's, I think, I, you know, I don't know him, but hearing those, I immediately think that's the intimacy of love. Right. You know? Where you, you go as you are and you're fine because you trust that love to be deeper and wider and more beautiful than anything like that. Yeah. I think that's what we're moving toward, that infinite freedom. <laughs> but we can't do it until we stop with the license. You know, if we think we have a license for these things, that's the offense. Uh, I go back to that story of that that watching the Pope when he was giving that lecture and that five-year-old boy oh god gets away from his parents backstage and runs up and sits in the pope's throne while the pope is lecturing down front and and he gets away with it you know nobody oh. nobody runs in to 
you know, wrestle him to the ground or <laughs> anything. <laughs> and even the Pope, you know, turns around when he hears the tittering in the audience, he turns around and looks and he smiles and, and continues on. You see, if you can sit with the attitude of the child like that, you know, if you can have that innocence inside like that with your beloved, then you too can do R&D in your shoes. Right. You know, yeah. you too can throw the flowers at the picture. But right. if you if you don't have that purity, you know, if some teenager was able was to go out on that stage and sit in that chair knowing what the chair was and knowing what he was and expect that same kind of thing, it wouldn't work at all. You would have two or three security guards out there and that guy would be carted off stage, you know, and uh, who knows where what would go from there. So it's that purity inside, you know, that tr that love of God, you know, to have that first and foremost, that sweetness of a youth, of a child, you know, that we hear over and over again in the scriptures, that the holy, the holy people, holy men and women loved the company of children. You know, yes. Because they shared, they shared that sweetness. Love him then and seek no consolation elsewhere. I hope you will soon receive it. Adieu to God. I will help you with my prayers, poor as they are, and shall always be in our Lord yours. A lovely, it would be a beautiful letter to get if you were sick, actually. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That sweetness. And it's the, you know, it's the thing that, that these days, love and prayers, thoughts and prayers, they're, they're ridiculed, you know, but they're ridiculed because they don't carry with them the sincerity of a saint. You know, it's like most of the time today, yes, thoughts and prayers are more for the person offering them than for the person suffering. It's kind of like, yeah, I can't do anything, but I can be nice. But when the thoughts and prayers really are for the person, when the heart really is for the person and your prayer is one of sincerity and earnestness for the person, then there is nothing to laugh at in that. There is nothing lacking in that. That is the most beautiful thing we could give to each other is a sincere thought of love, a sincere thought of well-wishing, an earnest desire for your betterment. That's a beautiful thing, and we should freely give that. There should be no shame in that, no lack of accomplishment in that. But it has to be tied to the heart. You have to sincerely want the better for the other person. You know, there you have to feel the pain of their suffering. Mm -hmm. You have to, and you have to know it to be your own for those for for thoughts and prayers to be meaningful. So, otherwise, otherwise. <laughs> it is what it is today you know it's a thing of ridicule what are your thoughts and prayers their words and nothing nothing gets done i think the context matters too i mean if you're you're delivering it you know i think we hear it as when it's like a public figure speaking to people that they don't know and and the lack of sincerity comes across and and i think it's very different from when you you know when somebody is a fan, you know, somebody's got, you know, when you, when, when somebody is in a, yeah, when that's trans, you know, communicated authentically in, in the, you know, when, when someone's actually got like, you know, an illness that's not dealable with, I think, you know, it has a different, you know, resonance, even with people who aren't spiritual, I think, because yeah, that, that is all you can ask is that, others be, be thinking of this person that you care about who's who's suffering yeah yeah no it's the same and the context is important but even in that context if the politician was sincere about it it would have its effect mm -hmm. you know if you could see that he walked away from that speech desperately trying to do something you know desperately trying to make a difference desperately trying to invest himself in a change that would meet the situation then yes, there, you know, that also is not ridiculous. You know, it's, it's, it's the insincerity that makes those kinds of gestures, not just, not just ridiculous, but offensive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, because it's just, anyway, we don't have to think about that. 
we have to think about our own sincerity and make sure that we don't propagate it, that we don't that we don't buy our way out by nice words. <laughs> that we really, oh goodness. See, if we talk too much about these things, mother keeps poking me. <laughs> like, I just get this tinge of like, oh my God, yet another thing I have to work on here. Lordy, <laughs> how many of these things are there? All right, let's 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 jump into the 14th letter here. And it's to the same person. I render thanks to our Lord for having relieved you a little according to your desire. Huh, so apparently she did take comfort, or he or they took comfort mm -hmm. in this letter. I have been often near expiring, but I never was so much satisfied as then. Wow. Yeah, if you know, uh, Brother Lawrence, actually, I'm thinking of St. John of the Cross, but... Uh, wow, to be able to say that, I've died many, nearly died several times. And I never was so much satisfied as I was then. Mm -hmm. mm. Oh, wow. <laughs> wow. Can I, can I ask you something? Yes, Ma. Has there been any book on, on his life at all? How his life turned out? How he died? Mm. Uh, there is a biography, of Brother Lawrence. Uh, you can find this book that we have. Some of them have a biography, an auto a biography in there of his life. Um, I don't know how much of it is actually known. Like I don't know if they know how he died or. Whatnot. Yeah, I have another book with a little bit of the biography, but not enough. You know, not a complete one, I would say. Right. Let me see if that's the same one I've got. Let me look. Does it, Kamala? Does it say how old he was, or when, or not? What is that? Do we know how old he was when he passed away, or anything? I, I, I think six, 61 or sixty-six or oh, something. Yeah. I think I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. Like the one place you. Oh no! He said he was nearing eighty. Oh. In okay. one of the letters, he said he was nearing eighty. So he lived a long life, but I heard that uh, later on he could not even move. So he needed help to turn from one side to the other and mm -hmm. all of that. Um, because this is such a glorious life. I really would like to know mm -hmm. more about him. And Sarah, I really would like to keep in touch with you and talk about, hear any, everything about sure. Sonia Shetan and the... Sure. I, have some I did not get much of a time with him, you know. Oh, yeah. I have some fascinating stories. Yeah. You do? Yeah, I really would love it. Oh, we should schedule the time for you to tell us those stories. I'm I'm not going to let you get away with that, Kamala. <laughs> 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 yeah, he was really phenomenal, you all, even before I really knew who and what he was. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, it'll be delightful. Maybe next next week, maybe we'll schedule have a little bit of time. I'll stop just a few minutes early and, and we can hear a few stories. Yeah. Oh, that would be uh -huh. wonderful. Uh, there is a book, you know, you you probably have seen yes. that book from the reminiscences. It's a you will laugh and cry and do everything at the yeah. same time. Karen Toner wrote a book about his teachings, and then uh, mm -hmm. Todd Thomas wrote a book. Um, Todd Thomas took care of him towards the end of his life. Yeah, yeah. Thomas, I have met. Yeah, you know him. Yeah. Yeah, Mr. Bush, Thomas, and of course, Vera, you know. Yeah, yeah. Vera was a lovely woman. So, yeah. Oh, he, I'm really, sorry. but a real, uh, yeah, fabulous speaker, you know. Yeah. Yeah. He spoke with Paul Tillich and everybody, Swami. I mean, the man was an incredible scholar. Wow. Yeah. You know that? Swami? Well, you, I, I'm yeah. not surprised by because I would imagine more than a scholar, he was an experiencer. You know, there's a sure. real difference, a real difference from somebody who knows something and somebody who's yeah. telling you about something they, right. they experience. Right. Uh, yeah. Uh, and, and I think I, that with, with yeah, with all please. the scholarship or every all the knowledge that he had, what I have seen is he had nothing but mother inside. Yeah. Complete right. mother. There is nothing but mother inside of him. And, and having never met him, I have heard that from so many different sources, you know. Yeah. And the, the beautiful thing about that, we reverence him for it, yes, and we should. 
but you also only have mother inside. Right. And you he know? would say that. He would yes. say that. He would say that. <laughs> yeah. You know, he, that's, he that's was so thing. humble. I did. De I dedicated my senior thesis to him and all of this. And he'd write to me and he'd say, no, 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 no. Take that out. This is all mother. This is all mother. Please, please, you know, and just so humble and so extraordinary, um, really. And he was there for so many people. He never turned anybody away. Did you all know that? He didn't turn anyone away, people with such severe problems. It was really incredible to see. Anyway, sorry. <laughs> no, it's wonderful. This is why we're here. The holy company like this. This yeah. is where it happens. Yeah. And it's inspiring because it, that's exactly right. Humility is what allows people to see the divine in you. Mm -hmm. Get your ego out of the way. Step out of it. <laughs> push that elephant out the door if you can, mm -hmm. you know, get it out of the way. And what's left? Divine love. Right. What you're made of. right. Everything, everything that you go for in your life is because of your faith in divine love. Mm -hmm. You may mm -hmm. think it's objects, you may think it's conditions, you may think it's this, that, or the other. But Vivekananda says very clearly, the one and only motivating force in the universe is love. Mm-hmm. He goes on to say, it is for the love of the sun that the earth circles. It's the love for the love of the neutron that the electron circles. You know, that, that it is love is the only motivating power in the universe. Mm -hmm. What an amazing, what an amazing thing to come to that understanding. You know, we have from Eckhart Tolle, we have the notion of love and light being the same thing. Mm -hmm. And now we can add to that love and gravity are the same right. thing. Right. Know? He's still alive, isn't he, Swami? He is. Yes, he oh. is. I, I I know his housekeeper. <laughs> is he in San Francisco or where is he? Uh, he's in, well. I don't know where he is, but he has a house in Santa Barbara. I oh. imagine at that level he's got other houses too. But he lives in Santa Barbara. Oh. And uh, Gloria, who's a dear friend of mine, uh, is is good friends with his. Uh, caretaker who takes care of the house and what? Oh, what isn't that traveling. interesting? Yeah. Traveling. Yeah, I had her when I was out in California. We were in conversation. I was trying to see if I could manage an audience with him to kind of just <laughs> sit for a few minutes with him. But we see how successful that was. It's <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, no, it's so, interesting. Yeah. So, Alex, uh, where are you? Are you in Colorado, or where are you? I'm I'm in uh, the Los Angeles area. Oh, so you knew Swami in Los Angeles? Yeah, cool. You go to the temple there. Yeah, oh, that's wonderful. Yeah, see, we used to be able to see each other face to face when I was in Hollywood. So we're still seeing each other face by to face, yeah. but it's a few pixels in between now. And and I miss the 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 musical uh, opening. Yes. Ah. I, well, I can still do that. I just have to bring the piano in here, which I'm totally willing to do. I, yeah, that's I, a good yeah. idea. Maybe I'll do that. I'll bring the piano in the room here. Then we can suffer through that together. No, <laughs> songs are great. <laughs> I, would, I would love that. They, they're very much, you know. Cool. Well, we'll do it for sure. For, for next week, we'll start. And the next week, we'll take about 15 minutes at the end for for you to to share some of your stories and yeah, some pretty pretty amazing stories yeah oh, that would be so nice that will be where nice. are you sarah i'm in portland oregon oh okay wonderful but i grew up in la I grew yeah up, but yeah but i'm in oh, portland good. this is quite the modern world isn't it yeah la yeah. portland tech are you in texas kamala yes in, in houston and here I am in Boulder, Colorado, Lafayette. 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 Yeah, Lafayette, that's the poor man's Boulder. <laughs> so, it looks beautiful there in your um, your little vignettes that you do. It looks beautiful. So you're yeah. right. You can walk outside your door and you're in nature, correct? From yeah. What I yeah, I have to walk down to the end of the block, but yes. Well, uh, yeah. and, and it's it's amazing because it depends on what direction you go if you go one direction you get the mountains right now they're snow capped 
and the drama of the of the sky over the mountains every day is breathtaking every day i'm like oh my god that's unbelievable and then you turn 180 degrees and you look out and it's just flat as far as the eye can see with this beautiful golden uh, grass that just undulates in the breeze and the wind against this again the sky here is just you know, the, the, yesterday I took a picture of it. I, if I could possibly show that, I don't know. I took such a, it was a wonderful picture. Let me see if I can do it here. Pick it up and show you it. You will put it on your log, right, Maharaj? Well, I'm gonna try and put it up there in front of you right this very minute. Okay. Um, let's see. Somehow I can do this. Let me see if I can figure it out. Oops. How do I do? I used to do this on uh, oh, apps. Let's see. No. Share screen. Security and privacy of grants. Sorry, it's getting a little bit more involved than I thought, but it's still possible. Let me see. It's giving me all kinds of problems. Okay. I have to get my computer permission to show my desktop. And then after I did that, it said, well, Zoom will stop recording. If yeah. you show this up, do you want to quit Zoom and restart it? Like, well, that'll, that'll be yeah. disturbing. Since we were talking about some session, I just want to show a picture of him. Oh, yeah, that's a nice picture. Yeah, um, yeah. very young. Very can young you bring song. it closer or do something? So um, it's oh, in your... Can you see it at all? You know, it's not focused because you have your um, your background blurred out. Yeah. Let, let me see. Let oh, me there it is. Oh, yeah. Show there that to is. Alex and everybody. This is his young days. Do you Very see young that? days. He was quite the dapper dresser. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I didn't know him then. That was like the 40s or 50s, wasn't it, Kamala? Yeah, I think so. Yes. Very young, Swami. When I saw him, he was already 90s. Oh, much later, yeah. He wow. was in, yes. he was probably in his 70s or 80s when I saw him. Yeah, he dressed like Jesus. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he did. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Cool. Alex, he was really cool. He was really yeah. cool. And your pup could have just come and sat right with him. It was <laughs> <really> extraordinary. <laughs> so anyway. Awesome. All yeah. right, well, we're at, we're at eight o'clock.